Three, eight. Awesome. Okay. We uh, make sure we got it all. Thank you, Angus, for getting us started there. And let me get things together. So, all right. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. And okay. Peter. I uh, Peter. Yeah. I just, oh, yeah. I just said uh, CME today is one five three three eight. Okay, you know what? And I'll put that in the chat here in a minute once uh, Dan gets started. Thank you for that. All right, so welcome everybody. It's eleven oh two, and uh, we're really excited about this uh, this particular topic. And certainly, our guest speaker. Uh, many of you know or have heard of Dan Davis. Uh, I've gotten to know Dan over the years, and really have followed his work specifically in resuscitation and he's done just incredible work uh, not just in EMS but in hospitals with uh, CQI looking at data looking at outcomes um, and he's really well published in the field um, what caught my eye was something that uh, Dan wrote uh, it was an op-ed uh, an editorial commentary that was um, about a, a pre-hospital emergency care publication that recently came out and it's something that I'm uh, really intrigued about and I'm really a big believer in, which is, should we just intubate every patient with TBI just because their GCS is less than eight? And uh, um, I did post a commentary for everyone to read um, in the, um, on the FAEMSMD site, but uh, there's nothing better than hearing it from Dan himself. So Dan, I'm going to pass you the mic and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to share my screen here. And do you now see my slides? Uh, yeah, we do. Perfect. Perfect. Yep. Thanks, Dan. Well, thank you again. Thank you for having me. Um, as I went through um, my lecture and then reread your email and it said 20 minutes and 10 for questions, I actually uh, was going to invoke Paul Pepe, who uh, suddenly appeared on my screen. So he's sort of like a, a genie in a bottle here. But uh, his rate of slides per minute has always been twice as fast as the rest of us, which probably reflects uh, his neuronal speed as well. Uh, but it was funny to see him because I was actually going to reference him as, as my motivation for refusing to let go of any of my slides. <laughs> Um, but what I'd like to do is is kind of lead you through a path that I've taken as an EMS medical director in trying to um, solve a problem. And uh, I've spent most of my career in San Diego. Uh, more recently, I've started working in uh, Montana. So here's a video I took a couple months back. Doesn't look quite that uh, sunny and uh, warm anymore. But uh, I figured since this was Florida based, I would have to explain what those big lumps of dirt are in the background. Those are called mountains. Um, and, uh, and so I'm excited to kind of begin a new chapter with some of my medical direction and research. But I want to take it way back to when I uh, was still in residency and the uh, triumvirate of Peter Rosen, who really kind of defined the field of emergency medicine, David Hoyt, who uh, was the head of trauma in the United States and is now the head of all surgery, and then Larry Marshall, who was really seen as the preeminent neurosurgeon interested in brain injury, for some reason handed me all of the data for the San Diego paramedic RSI trial. And uh, this was back uh, sometime around the turn of the millennium and then got published a couple years later uh, when the assumption was that every patient with traumatic coma and GCS8 intubate was, of course, the rhyme, um, needed to be intubated. And we were really looking at all the missed opportunities uh, where paramedics were taking patients directly to the hospital and we were missing out on 15, 20 minutes of time uh, that they could have been intubated. This study was powered for a 10% improvement in mortality, and it ended up being exactly a 10% difference in mortality, uh, but in the wrong direction. In fact, for a while, I was convinced that our statistician got the zeros and ones mixed up, that there's no way that suddenly intubating more patients with head injury 
was going to increase mortality. Uh, we were psychologically prepared for the possibility that it didn't work, but certainly not for the idea that it could be harmful. And so I spent the next 10 to 15 years trying to figure it out. I went back to the original assumptions. Where did GCS8 intubate come from? And it turned out there wasn't a lot of strong evidence. In fact, if you really trace it back, it comes from the OBGYN literature uh, with uh, women who suffered postpartum hemorrhage and drifted into coma and were prone to aspiration. Um, very different than what we were seeing in the field. but. There wasn't a lot of data, so I went back and called the trauma registry in San Diego, which was one of the first in the world, and we had tens of thousands of patients, and it turned out that no matter how I sliced and diced it, uh, that early intubation was always associated with an increase in mortality or a decrease in survival. But yet my three mentors were telling me the opposite, and so uh, it really set me on a path and the, uh, the Air Medical um, Agency in, in California was, was my um, testing ground for a lot of interesting things. Now, we divide the world into three basic physiologic elements, perfusion, oxygenation, and ventilation. And I'll kind of jump to the, uh, the end here and then go backwards and trace how I got here. But what I found was that there were opportunities to improve care in each of those three areas. And what I've come to sort of realize, or at least my strong bias at this point, is that um, we haven't yet seen whether early intubation is helpful or harmful. Um, there's some tantalizing data saying that it is helpful, and I'll show you some of that in a, in a bit. But that this procedure is so fraught with potential error that if you don't do everything perfectly, you will wipe away the potential benefit and you will actually potentially cause harm. And so with regard to oxygenation, our baseline uh, intubation success in our helicopter program was only about 84% uh, before we started this program. Two thirds of the time there was a desaturation, oftentimes into dangerous levels and sometimes producing cardiac arrest. With regard to perfusion, we've started recognizing the interrelationship between what we do to improve oxygenation or ventilation and how it affects perfusion. Um, and, uh, and a lot of that actually came from the early work of, of guys like Paul Pepe, who was presenting um, similar data at the same conference where I presented our paramedic RSI study at the, the, uh, the trauma meeting. Um, but we found that uh, many of the arrests were related to patients who were hypotense, that they often collapsed in the wake of their RSI medications. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And once they arrested, survival was not particularly good. Um, even these witnessed arrests had a survival to hospital admission, which is roughly double what you'd expect to see coming out the other end uh, of only 8%. And then ventilation, which is really where I made a lot of my um, uh, gains in knowledge, uh, turned out that we routinely hyperventilate, and that causes particular problems to the brain, uh, as well as increasing intrathoracic pressure and, and lowering cardiac output, especially with the fast rates that we see all over EMS and emergency medicine for that matter. So if there's a take-home slide, it's slide number two or three or whatever this is, that these are really the opportunities. And I want to try and show you that these are solvable uh, with simple interventions that mostly focus on education. So let's start with oxygenation. Um, we were one of the first groups to start using simulation when the simulators were really kind of a brand new thing. But it required that we come up with some kind of an algorithm that I'll show you. And then more recently, a checklist to make sure that uh, we've covered all the bases prior to the initial attempt. Pre-oxygenation wasn't necessarily an automatic thing in those days. This is 10, 15 years ago. And the thought was if your patient had a full stomach, that pushing air into their lungs was gonna push air into their stomach too and, and cause regurgitation, make it more difficult to intubate, et cetera. So we tried to intubate without having to positive pressure ventilate as part of our pre-oxygenation strategy and essentially just using uh, non-rebreathers as best we could. 
I think more recently with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, we've seen even the use of things like high flow oxygen via nasal cannula. And then coming up with different ways of picking the patients that GCS-8 intubate is too simple um, and that we can try and anticipate which patients might give us some problems using some uh, new uh, mnemonics uh, that I'll, I'll share with you in a second. Here is the first publication about using simulation, and I think most of you kind of accept that that's just part of it, uh, but this was sort of a revolutionary thing in those days. Uh, expensive, because we were renting out an anesthesia suite with an anesthesiologist, um, so we had to quickly learn how to do it ourselves to avoid paying someone else's salary. We found that the crews all found it helpful, the most experienced ones found the very specific technical skills like cricothyrotomy or use of a bougie helpful. The new hires were more interested in just the general cognitive approach, but everyone found something. And this is ultimately what we produced as our algorithm. Now it's got a lot of interesting features that we're still kind of going back and, and questioning. Um, and I'll show you some of those things in a second, but it follows a lot of the other difficult airway algorithms in that the top line is about trying to get them intubated on the first attempt without a saturation. The middle line is then using attempts number two, three, or, or more to get them intubated again without allowing them to desaturate. And then the bottom line really looking at a crash airway, either a very rapid uh, attempt for endotracheal intubation or moving on to an alternative like a surgical airway or, or a supraglottic device. Um, and this algorithm has really been the centerpiece of our approach to airway management. Early on, we showed um, that there was a very rapid acceleration in, in desaturation uh, once uh, the patient's oxygen saturation crossed below 93%, which we should have been able to predict just by looking at the hemoglobin oxy dissociation, uh, oxygen uh, dissociation curve, but uh, it was nice to be able to show it in actual patients. Um, and it created a very clear line in the sand that all of our pre-oxygenation attempts were geared towards trying to get the oxygen saturation above 93%. And to make that point, we would stick it on the edge of El Capitan, again, a 3,000 foot cliff that rises above the floor of Yosemite Valley, um, to make a point that uh, when you desaturate, you really do kind of fall off a cliff and that, uh, that things accelerate below that 93%. In fact, we found that the desaturation rate, if you could drive the SAT above that, was only 6% versus 100% if you tried to intubate uh, at 93% or below. Um, but a third of the patients were being intubated in that danger zone because of the fear of positive pressure ventilation. Um, and so we made it okay to do positive pressure ventilation. We did it in two different ways, synchronized with the patient's breathing before they get their RSI meds. And then a different approach once the patient is paralyzed using longer inspiratory times um, to try and simulate what you might do with a ventilator uh, in a patient with ARDS, uh, but doing this for all patients who required uh, pre-oxygenation. And we saw once we started this training, which we called Advanced Airway Resuscitation Training, or AART, um, we saw a very rapid decrease in the desaturation rate per downloaded uh, oximeter devices. And so the uh, the desaturation rate uh, after the first four or five years was actually lower than what's been reported in the emergency department. And although you won't be able to read this, more recently we've challenged the New England Journal of Medicine article that said we should just positive pressure everybody who's undergoing emergency RSI, um, suggesting per our data that if a patient is already above that critical threshold, all you're doing is increasing the aspiration risk by inflating the stomach. So if they're above 93%, leave well enough alone. Uh, but if they're below that, uh, then it's a huge mistake to not try and um, positive pressure ventilate in order to improve their oxygen saturation, that you're basically guaranteeing desaturation and in some cases, uh, even arrest. We created a difficult airway predictive tool. This would essentially replace lemon, which was really meant for outpatient anesthesia. Um, this is called heaven. And it really relies on a combination of physical features that you can identify even before you give the meds, like uh, extremes of size, blood, blood, vomit, fluid in the airway, 
And then physiologic features like existing hypoxemia or suspicion of anemia, uh, which lowers your oxygen carrying capacity. We were able to show that the more of those criteria present, the less likely you are to be successful, especially looking at first attempt and first attempt without a desaturation. Um, and so we added that into the algorithm and more recently have even used the presence of certain criteria to suggest we should be doing direct laryngoscopy versus video. I think we've seen a major shift in the last 10 years where everybody is using video laryngoscopy, but it takes a little bit longer. It takes longer to pass the tube indirectly and it takes longer to, uh, to place um, um, the, uh, the, or to, 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 uh, to um, set up and, and uh, give that first breath. And so when speed is of the essence, like a patient who's hypoxic or anemic, we still advocate the use of direct laryngoscopy. And we found that that actually predicts um, higher first attempt success and first attempt success without desaturation. And to help kind of stimulate some of this stuff in the heat of the moment, we developed a card that's handed to the ground providers or whoever is there on scene to kind of go through just like the uh, sort of aviation checklist to make sure that we've got everything in place so that we don't make a simple mistake like not having working suction, like oxygen not being connected to a tank, et cetera. And over a period of two or three years that we implemented implemented this across air methods, which is one of the larger air medical um, companies in the United States, we saw intubation success rates overall, first attempt, first attempt without the saturation, exceed those of anesthesiologists even doing things in the operating room for elective surgery. And given um, Peter's involvement with pediatrics, we crunched some data looking at pediatric intubations and found that whether we're comparing to PEDS ICU attendings, um, the NEAR database, which is an emergency medicine one, or even pediatric emergency physicians, that our crews routinely exceed uh, their standards with either first attempt or first attempt without an adverse event, which is mostly desaturations. So by applying some of these principles, some of which required us to do original research, we were able to make the procedure much safer and then hopefully um, reduce the likelihood that we're causing harm. And if we look then at the clinical outcomes, particularly in traumatic brain injury, um, that same graph I showed you before where everyone seemed to be doing worse with early intubation, suddenly you compare the air medical crews to either patients intubated by ground providers or even emergency physicians, and their survival rate is uh, routinely about twice as high to perform the procedure in the field. And in fact, the intubation success rates are higher than those reported in emergency medicine. And so when I get pushback from my colleagues in the ED saying, why did your crews stay on scene and do this uh, procedure in the field when they could have done it in the uh, more protected climbs of the emergency department, I ask them, why don't they call our crews to come do their intubations because our success rates are higher than theirs, which doesn't always go over well, but at least makes the point. And using some interesting computer algorithms, we can show that um, the vast majority of trauma patients either live when they're supposed to, that big set of lines in the middle, or die when they're supposed to, the ones just to the left. But when you look at the heroic saves way out to the left, where they should have died and they didn't, or way to the right, where they should have lived and they didn't, you can see that the air medical crews generally are more likely to be involved in the heroic saves. And, uh, and these are ways that we can try and validate um, this approach. And here's even uh, one where the computer can kind of predict which patients are gonna benefit the most from air medical intubation. And basically the sicker the patient, the more likely they are to benefit probably because of some of those physiologic um, disruptions that increase the likelihood of things like desaturation or cardiac arrest. And that's a good transition to the perfusion side of things, the idea that a lot of what we do um, with regard to airway management has an effect on perfusion. And so the key take homes are gonna be using end tidal CO2, not only as a tube confirmation, but as a perfusion sensor, especially with patients in shock. We'll talk briefly about different RSI medications and then some more about preparation before RSI, specifically push dose pressors. And then I'll get into a little bit of how we interface between vent, uh, ventilation and perfusion. 
What we found is that patients who arrest in the back of a helicopter do it quickly. They kind of bounce around at a critical threshold of just above 80 systolic. And once they penetrate that floor, they very rapidly deteriorate into cardiac arrest in a matter of four or five minutes. Um, so that's going to have some implications with how we uh, approach these patients. Now, in title, if you're not used to using it as a perfusion indicator, is actually a much better early indicator of a patient sliding towards cardiac arrest that those same patients, about 100 of them, who had deteriorated into cardiac arrest from the previous screen, um, you can see those same patients' end tidal CO2 values here, which start out surprisingly normal uh, just 45 minutes before arrest and then gently decrease to a critical threshold of uh, about 25. So if there's one thing you remember, an end tidal CO2 of 25 is a kind of a critical threshold. It's what we aim for in cardiac arrest with regard to compressions that potentially indicates a return of circulation. And it also is the gateway into cardiac arrest for patients in shock right there. We've shown that in air medical patients, um, the blood pressure and the end tidal CO2 parallel each other perfectly. Um, but we already have blood pressure, so what's the advantage? Well, entitled CO2 is continuous, it's non invasive, so you don't need that art line. But some more recent data suggests that you're going to see changes in entitled CO2 even before you see changes in mean arterial pressure. Um, that that might be the first indication not only of a descent into cardiac arrest, but even. Um, that your, your uh, resuscitative efforts are working, that you'll see the entitled CO2 change uh, up to five minutes sooner than a, an improvement in uh, mean arterial pressure. With regard to the choice of induction agents or specifically sedatives in this case, when I was still a resident, we looked at the idea that Versed, which was the standard at that time and had replaced some of the barbiturates maybe should have a cap of five milligrams. And we compared our crews in the north who didn't have a cap and would give an average of about 0.1 per kilo to the crews in the south who were giving an average of about 0.05 per kilo and showed that the likelihood of critical hypotension went up more than, more than threefold. More recently, we've seen a shift not from barbiturates to Versed, uh, but I would say from automidate to ketamine in all of emergency medicine. Uh, this reflects uh, a two or three year period where our crews who were given the choice, but were taught that ketamine might have better hemodynamic uh, profile than automidate. You saw them using it more and more. And still, I would say that's our most likely agent in a patient who's hypotense. Now, when we looked at the likelihood of a cardiac arrest, it was much higher in the patient's who were given ketamine, but again, those were the patients that the crews thought were most likely uh, to be uh, in some form of shock or hemodynamic embarrassment. And so we ended up looking at the incidence of cardiac arrest over the period of time that I just showed you, and it really didn't change much. So, and since then we've seen similar kinds of uh, patterns in emergency medicine that maybe ketamine isn't the answer. And so we just published on what we called the VIPER study, and that basically stood for vasopressor intravenous push uh, to enhance resuscitation, giving either vasopressin to trauma patients because it has some nice brain injury uh, characteristics and it seems to stop bleeding below the diaphragm, or phenylephrine, which was really what was being used most often by anesthesiologists for non-trauma patients, and looking at uh, whether that it corrected hypotension, how often they then went right back to being hypotense. Uh, did they ever go too far, which in a trauma patient going to be becoming hypertense could be an issue, and what our arrest rates looked at. The bottom line is that in their respective patient populations, both agents were very effective and very safe. They almost always corrected, very few of them got rebound hypertension, and most encouragingly, the likelihood of cardiac arrest dropped quite a bit um, when we started using these push dose pressors. And so this seems to suggest that more important than the presser, uh, than the induction agent that you choose is the idea that you try and prepare the patient for the RSI procedure um, by improving hypotension 
and making it safe or immediately addressing hypotension post um, RSI uh, with push dose pressors, which act faster and may even have some other uh, beneficial effects. And you can see here the overall likelihood of cardiac arrest dropped early on when we started training for better intubation. Um, then it basically pad uh, paralleled the incidence of hypotension. So the more likely uh, pathway to cardiac arrest was a drop in blood pressure until we started the push dose presser protocol. And now you see the, the cardiac arrest rate falling down, even though we had more patients with hypotension. And then just by applying the basic principles of high, um, high quality CPR, uh, high performance CPR, um, we saw uh, that the incidence of survival to ED admission more than doubled in our helicopter witnessed cardiac arrests. So we've oftentimes kind of ignored the helicopter as an important player in cardiac arrest because they generally aren't being dispatched to patients in cardiac arrest. Uh, but there are enough patients who actually uh, arrest in the presence of the air medical crews. Many of them are trauma patients. And the ideas that we've been propagating for the last decade or two in, in general cardiac arrest um, seem to apply to the helicopters too and that they can actually uh, increase the likelihood of survival, at least as far as we can take them to uh, ED admission. And the last little piece I'm gonna talk about is the ventilation piece. And the two basic principles are that you want to avoid hypocapnia. I think we all sort of understand that one now, but also avoid excessively fast rates, even separate from the end tidal CO2 values. And then ultimately, when you get those two down, you want to avoid prolonged inspiratory times, which often accompany people trying to breathe slower, that they often squeeze the bag longer, and that actually can um, increase the interthoracic pressure. Now, sometimes, of course, you want to do reverse ID ratio ventilation, and everyone's likely familiar with that um, in the wake of COVID, uh, but it's often an inadvertent thing that raises interthoracic pressure. We were able to show during that same San Diego paramedic RSI trial that the patients who came in by helicopter, even if they were intubated by the paramedics, um, did not have the same decrease in, in survival. And we speculated that had to do with their use of end tidal CO2 even back you know, more than 20 years ago and their familiarity with it um, and showed that the, those patients were less likely to come in hypocapnic. And in fact, the rest of the county then mandated the use of entitled CO2 in all intubated patients. And not only did we see the arrival PCO2 values improve over that period of time, but we saw the survival for moderate to severely injured head injured patients survive uh, at a higher rate over that same period of time. It's not enough, though, just to keep the entitle in the range that you want. And these are air medical data showing that they do a reasonable job with the entitle CO2. But the rate, the ventilation rates are often in the high teens, uh, mid and even upper 20s. And that creates its own issue with regard to interthoracic pressure. The way to think about it is that with every breath, the first part of each breath is just filling the dead space. It adds to the pressure in the chest. It does not participate in gas exchange. Um, and so as you breathe uh, faster and shallower, you see a larger and larger percentage of each breath taken up just by that dead space. And that would predict, which we were then able to show, um, higher interthoracic pressures with faster rates, independent of the entitled CO2. And if you look at the mean interthoracic pressure predicted by our models, uh, they're routinely coming in between 5 and up to 15 millimeters of mercury, higher than even a normal person's central venous pressure. So what that led us to is a different way of ventilating patients who were in some form of, of hemodynamic shock, uh, that a patient with either a pressure less than 90 or with low end tidal CO2 values uh, should have slower rates. If you need, you can increase the the uh, the tidal volume a bit, as opposed to either standard standard or what we all tend to use, which is lung protective ventilation, which is really meant for ARDS patients. Um, but the idea that there should be a different mode for patients who are in shock, that we don't want to um, send them into cardiac arrest or prolong the period of hypotension 
because we're ventilating too fast and too shallow. And with that, given that we just went through about eight hours of material in 25 minutes, I'm going to leave my email address up there. I know that uh, I think I think this is actually recorded so you can go back through it. But I encourage you, I beg you to reach out and ask questions, exchange ideas, ask for the papers. Um, very few people actually follow up, which is probably the reflection of me more than anything else. But it's OK to reach out and ask for stuff. And then if you're an educator, you know, if you want some of these slides, by all means. So there's my email address. Thank you again, Peter, for inviting me, and I'll take any questions we have time for. Yeah, you know, I'd love to get a couple questions in, and if, if anyone does have questions, raise their hand. I'm curious. Um, so, you know, the the two things that stuck out at me were the push pressers to resuscitate the patient, and you know, we've implemented DSI after Weingart and you know Jeff Jarvis, and we we've seen uh, great improvement in our success rates and the drop of our peri-arrest uh, rates as well, um, our peri-intubation arrest rates. Um, my question for you is, you know, I love what you just said about reducing the, um, the rate and increasing the volume. And Dr. Pepe's been talking about that for a long time. And Paul Banerjee has gone to one breath every 10 seconds or six breaths a minute. Uh, obviously, as you know, the American Heart Association has moved in pediatrics to 20 to 30 breaths per minute. Where do you stand on ventilation rates? Uh, uh, you know, I mean, in, in in general, you can you can talk about the pediatrics as well. But where do you stand on that for out of hospital cardiac arrest? Oh, for cardiac arrest, yeah. So the way that we ventilate in cardiac arrest, we actually do continuous compressions, even with an unprotected airway. Uh, we hold the mask with two thumbs on the mask and the strong fingers behind the angle of the jaw. So we call that the two thumbs up approach. And we synchronize a breath every 10th compression for adults. And then we drop it down to every fifth compression for small kids. Um, and uh, and so there is no, you're, you're essentially using the recoil of the chest to augment tidal volumes. We've found that they're consistently around 400 to 450 milliliters per breath. Um, but that leads you to a ventilation rate that's essentially a tenth of the compression rate, so somewhere around 10 to 12. Um, my belief is that we will eventually get to a point where we will modify the ventilation ratio, so we talk about it in terms of ratios, based on the entitled CO2. So if you had a patient with an entitled CO2 of 15, you could drop down to a breath every 15th or 20th compression, which would get you to that kind of three to six breaths per minute. If you had a high end tidal CO2, which might imply a patient who had more of a respiratory etiology, and that's been well shown by um, um, Dr. Germick in uh, Slovenia, um, that maybe then you move towards 10, every 10th compression or even every fifth compression, like you would expect to see in a pediatric population where many of the arrests are asphyxial. So, so rather than rates, we, we talk about it in terms of, of um, ratios, trying to time it to the upstroke, which is actually quite easy. Um, and if you really want to, you know, maybe in a future in 2023, uh, talk about ventilation and, and cardiac arrest. Um, if my early career was about push hard and breathe hard and give them everything they need, then the transition driven by people like Paul and and uh, and guys like Tom Ofter, Heidi, um, the second phase was a realization that those extra breaths, whether it's big tidal volumes or lots of them, really increase intrathoracic pressure. And for some patients, that's deadly. But the third frontier, the third wave, is going to be a realization that your body has a natural mechanism to keep blood from flowing through lung that's not being aerated. Basically, you know, every night when you roll from side to side, or if you have an area of atelectasis from whatever disease process is occurring, your body is basically saying, we're not going to send any blood to an area of your lung that's not aerated. And we're going to do that by increasing the pulmonary vascular resistance in that little area. Um, or essentially the opposite, if you open up an alveolus, it opens up the, the small vessels at the same time. 
what we had never thought about was the idea that during cardiac arrest, you know, 80 plus percent of your lung is atelectasis, which makes it really hard to push blood through. Um, it never was part of evolution to have to deal with cardiac arrest and chest compressions. And so there are some really fascinating data and animal models suggesting we ought to be inflating the lungs a little bit to hold the blood vessels open, even if that adds a little bit of pressure. And we're working with some folks um, in an animal lab that suggest that magical threshold is about 12 centimeters of water. That's about how much it takes to pop open, not just the alveoli, uh, but those vessels too, and that you get a paradoxical improvement in, in blood flow through the lungs, even though you're adding interthoracic pressure. So if that's true, you'll hear it here first, um, then we ought to put a breath in, maybe over inflate just to pop everything open and then drop down to say four cc's per kilo, hold that in there for probably a minute or two, put a cork in the uh, endotracheal tube and just hold the gas in the lungs so that those vessels stay open. Takes you a couple minutes to use up all that oxygen, more than a couple minutes, but eventually you wanna dump some CO2. So let that out and then repeat process maybe once every two minutes. So I'm predicting the ultimate ventilation rate is gonna be half a breath a minute, but it's gonna be a long breath. Wow, now drop the mic, Dan, I love it. There it is, there it is. <laughs> I love it. All right, well, uh, that, that was fascinating. Um, and you just love, I love your talks always. And um, I learned so much from it. I know that we had a lot of people on the call today from all over the country who did as well. So um, there, there's your email. I'll make sure to send it out as well. We're gonna we're gonna hop over to Paul's webinar now. Uh, feel free to stick around if you'd like. And uh, thank you so much.